Philip, you've been watching this. Uh, your thoughts as we get word that the jury has reached a, a verdict here. Well, good evening. Thanks for having me. Look, this is shocking. I was just doing a radio interview 10 minutes ago, and I said it's probably going to be at least a week. So, yeah, this is very interesting. I, my gut tells me, Brett, that this is probably a a prosecutor's verdict. Uh, fast verdicts oftentimes tend to be. Now, that being said, the defense counsel today in their closing statement, they went through a laundry list of reasons. I'll call them doubts for which a reason can be attached. And they said, look, if you believe any one of these gives you enough pause, uh, then that's reasonable doubt and it's your duty to acquit. And he is the last lawyer, Brett, that the this jury heard from. And you know what they say about primacy and recency? He is the last lawyer to make his case to this jury. Now, if they had their uh, minds made up, like Jonna said, uh, after uh, the defendant testified or at some other point in the trial, they may have just tuned out and not listened to a word that the defense said in their closing. But uh, I still go back to my gut, which tells me that a fast verdict like this probably means a conviction. And there you have it. I'm almost a little over a year ago today. That was the news breaking out of uh, Colleton County. Alec Murdoch was, of course, convicted of the brutal murders of his wife and, and son. But uh, I'm sure nobody here remembers that. But uh, it's just a little bit of news that we had here in the South long before we had anything to talk about regarding Fonnie Willis. And I promise we're going to stay away from her tonight because we've got plenty of misconduct or allegations of misconduct from a courthouse just in the neighboring state of South Carolina. Because this morning, embattled South Carolina clerk of court, Becky Hill, has resigned her position effective immediately. She was accused last September of tampering with the jury in the Alex Murdoch double murder uh, Murdoch, of course, being part of a legacy legal family. He was convicted, as I said, of convict of killing his wife and son in the South Carolina's low country. Now, Hill co-wrote a book with one of our guests tonight, Neil Gordon, and the book is called Behind the Doors of Justice. Now, this caused controversy because it was released so soon after the trial. We're also going to be joined by Mike Pachinik an Emmy award-winning reporter who worked at WSB-TV here in Atlanta. Together, they are publishing a new book. Uh, they're working also on a podcast and a docuseries found at trialwatchers.com. And with that, I'd like to welcome to the stage, there's Mr. Mike Pachinik, uh, and there is Neil Gordon. Welcome, gentlemen. How's everyone tonight? Doing Fantastic. Well. Pleased to be on the uh, podcast for the first time. Very nice. Yeah, right. Brought yeah. uh, chills to me watching uh, watching that about a year ago. Yeah, no, that's uh, that was uh, that clip I showed was uh, I was literally guys. I was I had done some media during the day uh, talking about the trial and I figured there's no way uh, on God's green earth that you're going to get a verdict that quickly. And someone uh, I think at Fox News, a producer or somebody had texted me and they're like, can you get in front of a camera right now? I'm like, are you kidding me? There's no way. And they're like, yeah. And it's like I had just done a radio interview with somebody. and I said, we might be uh, here in about a week or so discussing the breaking news of a verdict. And then it was just 10 minutes. I couldn't believe it. But certainly that was that was quite the trial. And uh, of course, that wasn't the the end of the story as uh you guys can talk about, and as our, our viewers probably remember, the clerk of court came under fire uh, because she was alleged to have been, you know, tampering with the jury. And I'll let you guys, uh, particularly you, Neil, you may know more about that part of the story. I'll let you refresh everyone on that. But, uh, but obviously, uh, the news today is that she's out of a job. And uh, as I understand, well, in fact, let me do this. Let me go ahead and share uh, this item right here from the post and courier that uh, Mike was nice enough to send to me earlier today. Uh, and it says here that Collinson County clerk of court, Rebecca Hill admitted to plagiarizing the opening section of her book 
on the Alec Murdoch double murder trial after her co-author suspended sales and vowed never to work with her again. In a December 26th statement, Hill's lawyer said she lifted much of the book's preface from a BBC reporter's work saying she was under pressure because of tight deadlines for the self-published book. Attorneys Justin Bamberg and Will Lewis said Hill was deeply remorseful for her unfortunate lapse in judgment. The plagiarized passages were unearthed by Hill's co-author, Neil Gordon, after messages from Hill's government email account were made public earlier in December. The plagiarism scandal deepens the troubles facing the embattled clerk who already was accused of ethics violation and jury tampering during the Murdoch trial. Earlier in the day, Gordon, who was who had been one of Hill's most vocal defenders in recent months, said he would not work with her again after she privately admitted stealing from the BBC reporter's draft. So there you have it. Uh, that's that's what we had from the Post and Courier back in in December. Um, so with that, I want to just start with you, Neil. First off, uh, introduce yourself to everybody and tell us who you are, uh, and what you've got going, and what your connection is um, to this hill. Certainly. Well, I've been in media work for a little more than 30 years and uh, never written a book before, uh, Philip. And uh, my wife just decided to take a, a buddy trip with her fellow photographer, Addie Strozier, uh, in February because she had heard about the Murdoch trial. So they just went to take some pretty photos of the low country and to sit in on the courtroom and to kind of learn. And as the trial was winding down uh, the day before the verdict that you were speaking of previously, uh, Melissa had a chance meeting with the clerk of court. They took a selfie together and communicated in the next week or two. And Melissa sent the selfie to her. They began to have some chat about Melissa wanting to do a coffee table book and Becky wanting to write a book. And she said, well, but I just don't know how. And Melissa said, well, let me introduce you to my husband, Neil, and he may be able to help you or refer you to someone. And we kind of hit it off on the phone and began a, a two-month race to finish a book over 200-plus pages. I would not recommend that in the well, future. Well, so when, who, whose idea was it to write a book? Was it, was it your idea? Was it her idea? Where was the genesis? Because the book, as I understand it, please correct me if I'm wrong, as I understand it, the book deal that she was after is is part of what got her in hot water because some of the allegations, uh, as I understand it, is that the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, their their state police investigators, they're looking at her for what I would call maybe theft of of employee time, basically doing work for this book, uh, PR for the book while she's on the government sort of a payroll or during her official, um, I guess, working hours. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. That's um, what the allegations are. And, and Mike, and I know I, that y'all are shocked. I know everybody just can't believe that a, a, a government official, an elected government official might do something uh, grifty like that. But I, anyway, be that as it may, uh, you had, as I understand, you said that in another, I think I read it online, maybe you had given an interview to sled yourself. And I think what, what you had said publicly was that that was the questions that they were asking you about is, is whether or not she was working on your book on, on the job. That's exactly right. This occurred uh, just Friday morning, just a, just three days ago. Uh, sled was uh, at my wife's studio to chat with me. And then Melissa also kind of was really good about keeping track of all the records, really the dates where we went out and did book signings and pu public speaking she did and press interviews. And it, uh, you know, ended up being about 20 of those type visits in the course really of about three months. And they were very much interested in knowing when this occurred. Was it on the weekend? Was it during uh, the week? If it was during the week, where was it? 
what time did it start? What time did it end? So they're very interested in, in making sure that she was not, um, yes, uh, working on, on government time. And, you know, to me, um, the big question is, um, you know, my, Mike and all Mike and I have you know been in salaried situations in the workplace. If you work a lot of extra hours and you take some time and you do some other things, you know how does that work versus what goes on in the government? And I think that's what ultimately is going to be decided upon. I mean, was she entitled to have some vacation time after working like crazy for six weeks during the trial? So. All right, let me let me pause right there for just a minute. And we've got in here with us uh, Mr. Mike Pachinik, and we haven't heard from Mike yet. And just so everybody understands who Mike is, uh, you two, I don't, you know, Mike, you want to introduce yourself or uh, tell everybody who you are and what is your relationship to this breaking news story? Yeah, thanks, Phil. Uh, so I was a broadcast journalist for the better part of 20 years. In fact, I know Neil Gordon because he hired me out of college. He was my very first news director in Augusta, Georgia back in the day. So I owe my career to Neil Gordon. Uh, and uh, we kept in well, touch over I mean, the years. <laughs> so he's the one that's to blame for all this, right? He's the one to blame. Yeah. He's either. Yeah. You can either thank him or where's blame my, him. Where's my commission? Yeah. It's, uh, the check's in the mail. So we reconnected in the last couple of years on some other projects. Uh, but about nine months ago, he reached out to me after the Murdoch verdict and he was getting ready to publish this book. And he said, Hey, Mike, I've got this idea. It's kind of crazy. Melissa was down there with her camera. She was documenting all of these folks who had in some cases driven hundreds, thousands of miles from home to witness the trial in person. And, and she took pictures. She got some what he liked to call guerrilla journalism video where she sort of like, you know, snuck in and got shots of folks doing different things. And he said, why don't we do a documentary about the Murdoch case? And I said, Neil, that's been done before. You know, there are three or four docuseries already out at that point. I think Netflix had just dropped its series. I said, after talking to you and after looking at some of the raw footage, I think the story really here is about the trial watchers, the people who put their lives on hold and went to the trial to sit and wait for four, five, six, seven, eight hours in some cases to get into the courthouse just to get a well. And, and like the there. people that are in our chat tonight, I'm sure a lot of those are, yeah. are the trial watchers. And, and I'm, I'm, I want to come back to this because I want to hear more about your project, which, you know, it's, it's literally about the phenomenon that is trial watchers. And there's a lot of that, of course, that uh, bleeds over into to folks who, you know, who watch law tube like this. And, yeah. uh, and so we want to definitely hear more about that, but, but I want to bring the conversation for right this minute back to what, what drove Becky Hill sort of out of her job today. And if we can maybe tie it into, to this book, into the investigation, and is it in any way, um, Neil related to the allegations of jury tampering? I don't think so. I don't think she tampered with the jury, to be honest with you. I, I think um, there's a fine line here. It, it, you know, did anything that she uh, said, did it influence whether the jury was voting guilty or not guilty based upon the standards of what the most recent justice said? And there was nothing that I heard, and I was in the courtroom in Columbia for that full day hearing with Justice Toll, and Becky was on the stand. She was very nervous, she told me she was scared, um, had some difficulty, you know, being there and such. But um, many of the jurors, I felt, were very, uh, very direct in saying that Becky didn't really say anything to them about situations. And there were some passing comments. Becky's very chatty. She's Southern grace and hospitality. And it, you know, she, you never know what the tone is of someone. So she might, she might have said, well, oh, big day, Alex taking the stand, you know, or whatever. I mean, but tampering, no. 
I, what, I what exactly I, was she accused of doing? Help refresh our memory on that, because where where did the defense get this idea that that Alec deserved a new trial because of her? What exactly did they say that she did? There were some they said there were some stray comments like watch his body language. Um, uh, th things of that regard, you know, little, little comments. Um, and there were some other things like they accused her of not allowing uh, smoke breaks or what have you. Well, you know, from being in the, in the courtroom, Philip, there's a, there's kind of a, a chief bailiff that really takes care of the jurors and she had a chief bailiff. And so well, Things yeah, but you know, to play devil's out, she's not supposed to be making comments though about the the testimony to the to the jury, right? right. I mean, she's right. so she, she maybe you're, maybe she was maybe she had no e intention, but you've got to admit that it was improper. I mean, you're not supposed to say or do anything to juries that are deliberating, other than you know things that are completely innocuous. But you're not supposed to make any kind of reference to how witnesses come across or or anything like that. She denies it. She claims she didn't. Um, she testified on the stand that she didn't. There were uh, there was two or three jurors that said there was a there was a stray comment. One or two little stray comments didn't have didn't influence them whatsoever. So you know I I don't know. I wasn't there, and I and I don't know. Um, but I think some of the, the I think they got some testimony or affidavits from some from some jurors. But, you know, in any event, the motion for a new trial on that basis was was denied. And I guess that's going to be part of the ultimate appeal in the case. So I guess no pun intended, but the jury's still out on that issue. Fast forward, though, to today, I want to talk about why why she's out of a job and what, how does it relate to to the book that you were were writing with her? Well, why, you know, why did she, why did she resign? Um, you know, I don't know. I, to be can't, to be honest with you, I was very surprised at how quickly the governor named her replacement, which tells me, I don't think this was very sudden. I think right. this was kind of planned. That's, did you feel the same, Mike? Did yeah. You, well, I mean, you can, you can read tea leaves as well as I can. I mean, when, when, when somebody just up and, and leaves an elected position like this, it's oftentimes announced informally ahead of time. She's got lawyers, okay, and her lawyers know how to talk to the government. Uh, and so they can, you know, they can negotiate sometimes the terms of departure and, and things like that. So I, I, I'm quite certain that this was not as sudden, at least uh, as we were. It was sudden to us, but it certainly on the inside probably wasn't. Now, but she's been accused of literally, as we said in the open, um, the, uh, and I want to come to this comment here about uh, the meeting you had on Friday, because I think you touched on that. I want to come back to it. But she was, she was, if I, so as I understand, she was emailing with the, a, a BBC reporter, and the BBC reporter accidentally sent a draft of the reporters or a piece of the reporter's own book. And so she, she basically stole it, lifted it directly from that BBC reporter and put it in the book that you were co-writing with her. Is that right? Yeah. She sent it in very late as we were really sending in the final manuscripts to the uh, editors and um, people read it over and just thought it was really well written. And by the way, the BBC reporter, uh, award-winning Sterling reporter. And so everyone thought it was just wonderful. And no one thought, and, you know, no one thought that uh, she may have plagiarized it or what have you, because everyone respected the position. There's a power differential. She's the clerk of court. Um, everyone spoke so well of Becky. I never, you know, I never assumed, uh, any differently and, um, she did it and she, uh, she apologized for it and, uh, was a awful mistake. And I don't think she'll, uh, she'll do that again. Should she, uh, should she write another book? Well, could, could, well, is that something she could be prosecuted for? 
I'm sorry. What's that? I, I, just, I, I just wanted to connect a couple dots because I feel like. The, yeah, like, go ahead. I, but I, but I want to. While you're doing yeah. that. Right, yeah. Also, um, I want either one of you can answer this. I want to know if you think that's something that she could potentially be prosecuted for. Is that some kind of fraud? Well, I'll let you Neil answer that in a second, but I feel like we should we should address the fact that part of the impetus for bringing this motion was that the attorney, Alec Murdoch's attorneys, were, were making the accusation that Becky Hill was tampering with the jury so that she could speed the process up and get the guilty verdict in order to uh. capitalize off of the book and seek out the media limelight. And I think it's really important for everybody to know, again, this was a self-published book, so there was no big advance from a, from a, from a publisher. So Neil and, and Ms. Becky put out money on their own to get this book going. But I'll, I'll let you pick it up from there, but I think that's an important point to make. Yeah, I've not heard, Phil, of anything um, related to fraud. We have heard from the BBC, um, and this was in the last couple of weeks, and they were not seeking any monies. They just wanted to make sure that all of the books um, have been removed as best we know, and that no other ones are being sold. And so we've gone through all the steps with Amazon and removing them from any small independent bookstores, uh, removing the audio type books and the, the digital files and such. And so we did that. And so I don't, I, I honestly don't think so. And we had errors and omissions insurance, but because of fraud, as you mentioned, yeah. Uh, they 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 were not going to uh, pay. Uh, yeah, insurance the, doesn't really cover intentional acts, and fraud is is an intentional act. And if if she is, you know, if she's defrauding you, you might have a claim against her. But if the insurance company is also, you know, insuring you, the whole thing can get quite messy. By the way, do you have any kind of civil claim that you're considering against her? Very good question. And we ended up, Phil. Uh, doing a, a bit of a settlement because I decided along with my wife that we did not want to be part of the book or part of the company that we were in business with them. And so basically we said, we want to, we want to sell all of our shares to you. So should you ever decide to take this title behind the doors of justice and kind of rework it, uh, you can. Uh, and so then they paid us some money to buy the shares. And so we oh, basically so did a, you, all right. So you so, backed out, you, you back. So you're not going to be part of finishing the book. Is that right? Yeah. So the book, the book was out and we sold almost 15,000 copies of the book for five months, but then we decided to, to shut it down, uh, because of the, because of the plagiarism. And then, um, instead of, to your point of, because because I did feel I was damaged because, you know, 15,000 books in five months, I'm thinking, well, could we get to 50,000? Could we get to 100,000 over time? And how much could that have affected me financially? But we, we've always had a great relationship and we've always just kind of talked. And I said, listen, you know, uh, if, if we can figure this out, I think this is the best course of action. They can decide to republish the book. It would just be removing my wife's photos, removing references to us, and it would just be their book. Well, as I understand it now, you also have, have reportedly donated uh, a bunch of the proceeds to a charity. Is that correct? That's right. Um, what charity was that? So on Monday, with Mike's help, um, we are, we've, we've mentioned this to the media across, uh, the Southeast and even nationally, we're going to go to a federal sentencing hearing for Alex Murdoch on Monday in Charleston, the attorney for a few families that have started a foundation in the low country will be there. And so, uh, I'm going to hand, uh, uh $2,500, which was the net proceeds of the book after I learned about the plagiarism. So I didn't want to, we didn't want to accept any money knowingly uh, that, that had been with plagiarism in Vine. So we just thought the right thing to do would be able to maybe help some others and uh, 
as Mike mentioned in, in one of our press releases, try to um, take something uh, that was pretty bad and, and make something good out of it. And in fact, with our next project, we're going to be donating some percentage of the royalties as well to some uh, victim rights uh, organizations in, in the uh, Southeast. All right, I want to get. I'm going to want to get to your next projects, uh, but first, I, I want to see if we can take some questions from the chat. Uh, this is one that I wanted to go back to uh, earlier, a few minutes ago. Neil, you talked about um, meeting with Sled. Is that what uh, Maria is referring to? She says she caught you this morning on another podcast and wanted you to elaborate. Yeah, so uh, we got a call, or I got a call in the middle of last week uh, from a SLED investigator, and he mentioned that he'd like to sit down and kind of talk in relation to the book and ask me some questions. I had already talked with SLED along with my wife the end of 2023. They just wanted to know how we met Becky, when we start writing and such. But in this case, he was very um, assertive about learning very spe very specifically um, about these uh, activities, promotional activities that Becky and I uh, performed, if you will, after the book came out. Yes, and he's about to get arrested. That's what that's what that tells me. I mean, that's look, I've been doing this almost thirty years, and and those are the types of pointed questions that tell me. That uh, that it looks like Sled is getting ready to to file some charges, and that also could could explain part of you know why the the resignation was so, so abrupt and was kind of effective immediately. Um, obviously, she wasn't going to run again. We already knew that. But now, when when you tell me that investigators are asking about employee time theft, essentially, and then I hear about you know, her stealing, admittedly stealing giant sections of a book from a, from a reporter who it's that reporter's legitimate work product. And I hear about all of this. I mean, I'm, I'm just, look, I'm just a guy reading tea leaves, but to me, it tells me that, that she probably is going to be a defendant in that courthouse herself, um, along with Alec Murdoch. So, it, you know, look, it, you, you probably did the right thing by, by parting ways, uh, with her, um, and and basically having nothing else to do with that book, but I suspect that uh, she's she's in for some legal troubles of her own. Um, and uh, looks like some of the trial watchers <laughs> agree. Uh, the Maria. So and then we've got um, Jenin says Jenin Georgia agrees. Um, so now we're going to potentially have Miss Hill herself as a defendant. Um, and, you know, and, and you guys are free to weigh in on that if you want to. That's just my opinion. That's just how I see it. When 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 I was alerted to this story, Mike, you sent this to me earlier today. I, I said to myself, this is not good. She's she's probably about to go to jail. But um, anyway, Neil, do you have anything you want to add to that? Any thoughts about it? Well, as you know, Mike and I worked on a on a news release today and sent it out. And, um, you know. We just wondered if her her resigning may um, somehow help her in in what you're discussing, what you're saying. In other words, could there have been some sort of a deal? You know, step away. Let's kind of um, clear the way for you know election season. Um, let's try to remove some of the black eye. What happened in the clerk of court's, court's office? and so forth and so on. I, you know, I don't know. All I know if is she was my client. I would tell her, I would say the first thing you can when, look, and I've said, and I promised I wasn't going to talk about Fonnie Willis too much, but I've said it about Willis and I'll say it about her. The first rule of being stuck in a hole is stop digging. And so I think this is maybe remediation on her part. I think this might be uh, sort of her effort to kind of, um, uh, mitigate some of the damage to to stop digging the hole that she's she's clearly in here. Yeah, uh, I would I would agree with you. Uh, you know, it's a very interesting question. I don't know if you. Uh, uh, I think it was Gary that mentioned theft of time, and he said something about what about uh, politicians who are out campaigning during time. Uh, 
there you go. Most po politicians are stealing time. You know, I'm I'm kind of curious. Um, I, I mean, I know she works 16, 18, and I'm not defending her, but I know she works 16, 18 hours a day during this six week trial and leading up to it and all. And it was, it was a lot, a lot of work. And I asked her, I, I said, as we were getting ready to go for a week to just hit media and do different speaking engagements, I said, do you have some vacation time? How does this work? And she said, well, I'm an elected official. I don't have to put in, you know, on a time card. I don't have to request time off like the people who work for me. I, basically, the governor is, she more or less said, the governor's my boss, if you will. And so I just thought, well, that kind of makes sense. I mean, as long as the work gets done, the trials come through, family court is adhered to. So I don't know. I don't know. Well, we'll certainly have to watch this and see where it goes. I, I think that she's in for a tough time. I think maybe she's going to be facing some charges, but who knows? I'm, I'm wrong all the time, and I might very well be wrong about this. So I want to kind of switch gears. Mike's been waiting real patiently, and uh, you guys have have got something else going on that, that dovetails nicely with this discussion. Mike, uh, tell, us, um, tell us more about this project of yours, the – this, this new endeavor, you're doing a podcast, a docu-series. Um, I think you're maybe even going to CrimeCon where you're, you're probably going to run into some people in this chat room uh, when you go to CrimeCon this year. What's going on with this project? What's it all about? And, and uh, where did you get the idea for it? Yeah, bags are packed for Nashville. We're, we are ready to go. So this is kind of a multi-pronged project, if you will, that started with this documentary idea that I mentioned, you know, Neil was like, let's do this documentary about the Murdoch case. And I said, no, I think this is really about the interesting stories of the folks who are going to these trials. And so as we started to collect these stories and talk to some of these people, we learned that they have a really interesting why behind the, you know, they're, why they're doing this. Um, in some cases, it's a past family trauma that they're trying to resolve. Uh, one of the couples, the sisters that we uh, interviewed, their father had been murdered 30 some odd years ago. Uh, the killer was never brought to justice. So they go to these trials to seek the justice that they weren't able to achieve in their own lives. Uh, Neil interviewed a journalist uh, who kind of calls himself a self-styled gonzo journalist who goes to all of these trials and documents everything. He goes to crime scenes. Um, he is an ex-con himself who is trying to give back uh, to, the, to the world by, by writing about uh, the, these crimes. And well, so let me, let me say this real quick, so, not to interrupt, but look, some of the most interesting people that I've ever met in my life were ex-cons, either, either sometimes even current convicts, people serving prison time. Sometimes they're the most, very, the most interesting and sometimes the most genuine and, and nice people that you might ever meet who you know are currently paying or have paid a heavy price for something but um obviously that's not always the case but but there's obviously some very fascinating people and that's a very interesting part of your story yeah and I, i'll let neil expand on that in a second but so as we were putting these stories together neil said you know what why don't we write another book why not we've, all, we've done, he's done one he's got one under uh, under his hat let's do another one so we're putting together an anthology of stories written by several different folks. Some of them are trial watchers themselves. Uh, some of them are folks like me who have spent my career covering trials and, and documenting them. Uh, we're going to do a, a chapter on the ethics of crime reporting and how journalism and journalists uh, can do their part to ensure that uh, victims are treated with dignity and respect and that the stories are told in the right way. And, and then we're going to do a podcast. We're going to try to be like you, Phil, and, uh -oh. uh, and put together a little <laughs> podcast, but uh, I don't know I'll let I Neil pick it up because uh, this really was his brainchild. I'm just along for the ride. No, not at all. Mike's been invaluable. Um, and I, you know, I should say, I just want to refer back to September 5th, again, uh, when there was that press conference with the uh, Alex Murdoch's attorneys, and Mike and I have been friends a while, and he's watching 
um, them uh, accuse Becky of doing the jury tampering, as Mike mentioned, for this book deal. And and Mike just texts me and he said, uh, Neil, they're they're talking about your book, aren't they? You know, your name's on the book. You probably need to speak out. And so yeah. it just sort of, you know, started getting getting involved in this true crime world and uh, and and getting out in front of it, I suppose. And um, just in my wife going to Colleton County and uh, documenting things with a camera and and video. How did she get the courthouse? I mean, let's let me just. I got to get some some details, some color yeah. details out of you. What was it like just trying to get into that courtroom for that trial? Because those of us who watched it online or on television. It just looked like it was a, looked like it was a packed courtroom. It looked really, really hot. It looked like it had no air conditioning. I could just I could just feel myself sweating looking at that South Carolina courtroom. What was it like trying to get in there? Well, um, interesting. And this is where one of the things that Becky did that has uh, probably hurt her hurt her case. It was supposed to be a first come, first serve basis where people started in line three, four o'clock in the morning to be able to get in. And it was a ticketing lottery system. My wife, wife waited in line the three or four days that she went. Um, she was there one time as early as five in the morning. One of the people, the, the sisters that Mike has profiled in the video and in the uh, book uh, got there at three o'clock in the morning. But there were, uh, but there were some people that would email Becky, who she never met before, and they said, uh, "Miss Hill, we're interested in going next Tuesday. Could we reserve a spot? Could we get in?" And she would say, and she said in emails that were made public, "Yes, just see the bailiff. You know, tell him I sent you, and you'll be able to get in." And then they were sort of ushered in the side door. But in theory. It was, you know, everyone wait in line for the Disney ride. And if you're the first hundred, you get in. And it was about a hundred. And then there was another hundred plus that were attorneys, courtroom staff, media members, the judges staff and so forth. A little more than 200. So you're right. It was a packed courtroom uh, every day. But a lot of people did, you know, really don't didn't know and don't know that you can be a trial watcher. You yeah. can just go. I mean, if you're like me, you like watching it from your, you know, your air conditioned office or your basement or wherever you might be. I've been in enough hot, stuffy, steamy courtrooms in the South that I don't know that I ever would want to have to do that at least voluntarily again. But let's, let's get back to, so your project. Now you're going to be talking about trial watchers. Are you talking about Mike? What motivates trial watchers? Uh, is there a psychology behind trial watching and, and nobody please in the chat be offended on this one because we don't want to, we're not trying to psychoanalyze you because I know we have trial watchers. I'm one of them too, by the way, yeah. but is there a psychology behind this? Are you looking into that? Is that part of what your work is going to be, Mike? Yes, sir. We interviewed a psychologist who specializes in media and her hypothesis, Phil, is that People who are intrigued by the trials and who follow them religiously do so for a number of reasons. Um, chief among them, they like problem solving. They like mystery. They like to sleuth and try to figure out things and get to the bottom of circumstances. That's one reason. Another reason is uh, primarily the trial watchers who are women and and they are a large percentage of the trial watcher population according to this psychologist they look at these trials as a manual as to how to stay safe how to avoid becoming the victim of a crime and so there are a myriad of reasons why people are interested and to what degree they're interested but those are sort of the main uh, her main uh, hypotheses as to why and uh, it, it's pretty fascinating. But as we're starting to peel back the layers of the onions here on these stories, we're finding that everybody who does this, everybody that we've encountered, has some underlying reason as to why they're, you know, taking the time to spend four or five hours waiting in line to get into the stuffy courthouse and to sit in there and to watch.
Well, and, and you've been a crime reporter, uh, you know, as long as maybe I've been a lawyer. So I know that you're no stranger to pack court. I want to take just a minute yeah. and, and thank, um, uh, senior chief, uh, retired. So this is, I'm not just, obviously thanks for the super chat. That's going to go what, what I'm using super chats and, and any, any monetization I'm, I'm, I'm going to be doing an, an upgrade to some of the tech here. This is very low tech and I am, uh, I am a low tech guy and I, I need some help. So I'm going to be using some of this to, uh, try to make this channel better and, and sort of optimize it so we can bring better con con uh, content to you. But I wanted, I, Senior Chief was in the other night, and I, I noticed this pop up. And my first job out of law school, I was in the Navy as a Navy JAG lawyer. And so I wonder if this is a retired uh, Senior Chief Petty Officer from the Navy. And I guessed, uh, it is it possibly machinist mate, Senior Chief, retired? And I didn't know what SS meant, but it means submarine service, as, as, as he uh, or she pointed out to me. Um but uh, anyway, thank you not only for the ten dollar super chat, but thank you for your service um, as a retired. And in the submarine service is really something I can't imagine. You're talking about hot and stuffy. I would much rather be in a in a uh, hot stuffy courtroom than uh, I can't. Just, I just can't imagine being in a submarine. But thank you very much for the super chat. Anyway, I wanted to take a minute to uh, point that out. Thank you very much, sir. I Go ahead, Mike. I didn't mean to cut you off. Are you got a comment? Go ahead, Neil. No, I, I made the comment uh, in the book. I wrote a chapter all about some of the trials that I had a chance to cover and uh, how, you know, I just the phenomenon of watching other people come to these trials. And, and I made the comment in the book that, you know, I was paid to be there. Uh, you really have to be dedicated to to just show up and be there. And I and I think that folks who do this are, are really dedicated to that. I've seen some comments here. Uh, someone says, as a family member of uh, somebody who's kidnapped and murdered, I watch for the justice for the victim. That's it. It's exactly right what it is. Well, and justice and could mean many like things. A, it could, detective. You know, a justice, a justice could mean that uh, somebody who's wrongfully prosecuted gets found not guilty or charges dropped. You know, and we've talked about this, and here I go again. Uh, I won't mention her name, but but prosecutors have an obligation to from the very beginning to make sure that everything is fair. And so what their obligation is to do justice, whatever that might mean. And sometimes it means taking somebody, locking them up, throwing away the keys and putting them in jail for the rest of their life or worse. And sometimes it means dismissing a charge. And sometimes it means, uh, you know, just letting something go, even when somebody might be a little bit innocent it might, or not, a little bit guilty, it might be the wrong, the right thing to do. So, Doing justice is what is what really you know is the very unique role. Defense lawyers don't have that. Their job is to be a zealous advocate for their client. Period. And a judge is supposed to be you know the umpire calling balls and strikes. But the burden really is on prosecutors to make sure that justice, whatever that is, is done in any given case. Uh, let's see here. Um, there's got to be some. Uh, let's see if we can answer some questions here. Um, Thanks for all the uh, support and the comments there. I really appreciate it, everybody. Um, the, um, Mike, I want to ask you this question. As far as you're, you're, gonna, you're, you're focusing on trial watchers and the psychology of trial watching, uh, what, what is sort of the midterm and the longer-term goal for that project? Are you going to get more into the stories themselves, or are you going to focus on those who are watching and following the stories, or maybe some of both? I think some of both. Neil, would you agree with me on that? Yeah, but it's definitely, we, we like to say that um, a lot of this is written by trial watchers for trial watchers. Uh, you know, one of the one of the authors, a lady named Amanda Moore, who's an administrator at one of these Facebook groups for the Murdoch trial. And I'm not, and, and then she's involved in other chat rooms and all. And I asked her, how, how much time do you devote to this oh, about 40 hours a week. How much are you paid? I'm not paid at all, but she works it like it's her, it's her J O B. And so that's the part that's um, maybe more fascinating because I think other people to Mike's point about Netflix doing the docu series about the Murdoch trial, I think other outlets are doing an exceptional job covering the nuts and bolts of 
what these trials are all about and who is guilty and just sort of piecing well, some it of the together. trial watchers are the nicest i mean they're not they're very some of them are very nice but they're also knowledgeable some of the trial watchers that may be laypersons are some of the most knowledgeable people about what goes on or should go on or maybe should not go on in the courtroom reminds me some some of you watching or in the chat may be familiar with my friend kathy russon who is with law and crime network now but I remember Kathy from uh, many years ago, since before she was with Law and Crime, and she had a uh, the website was Court Chatter, right? And it was literally a chat room where you could get a live stream of a trial, and you just pop in the in the chat, and everybody and those chats were just wild, and it was it was fun to watch, and it was fascinating uh, because some of the people that were particularly the regulars in there. You know, a lot of them are non-lawyers and, and they knew more than me. And I'm that's not necessarily saying much, but I've been practicing law almost 30 years. And some of these people were just astonishingly uh, well educated on and how trials work. Have you guys come across that? Yeah, one of the um, people that I interviewed is a lady from Kansas City who came uh, from the Midwest and flew in to to Charleston and then rented a car and came into Walterboro to watch the trial. And what she shared with me is she worked for KU, Kansas University, all of her life, involved in higher academia, enjoys reading books, enjoys politics, really likes to see, you'll appreciate this, Phil, really likes to see how the prosecution and the defense thinks through and strategizes exactly how they are going to try um, to prove their perspective. And she's fascinated by it. And she watches the forensics people on the stand. And so this was her fifth trial that she had sat through. And she's also planning to go to Idaho if they're ever going to have the the trial for, uh, I think it's Brian. Koberger. Koberger. Yeah. And I That's asked her a, about it. I asked one. her about it, and she said, "You know what? I'm retired. I have a little bit of money. Some people are traveling around the country watching Taylor Swift. Why can't I go yeah. and pick a trial and really enjoy it? And it and it and it becomes educational. And to your point." Uh, they're they're very intelligent, and so that's fantastic. But um, forgive me, uh, I'm shameless shameless plug. But we're talking about some of these stories on our website at trialwatchers.com. Mike really took the lead on these video vignettes, these pieces, and there's no charge at all. You can kind of watch some of them. And just today, we put. The book up for pre-order if you want to if you want to purchase a copy you can at trialwatchers.com but one of the stories was fascinating to me and i didn't really know about it. it it was my wife remember i mentioned to you she went there with the whole purpose of taking photos of the low country being in the trial she ended up feeling a kindred spirit with the relatives of Alex Murdoch, who are victims, if you will, you know, family members. And I asked her about it, and then she expanded a little bit more on something that I knew about, but I didn't know very much, which is back in the mid-1990s when she was, um, I think, in her late 20s, her aunt's husband um, was accused and eventually convicted of murder. And by the way, he happened to be an attorney as well. It's like Alex Murdoch. And she shared uh, in this story, in talking with Mike and all, just about um, it was tr it was traumatic for her and the family. And by sitting in the courtroom now, almost 30 years later in Walterboro, South Carolina, those memories started coming back. And it was just, it's just fascinating. And, and you know, as media people, Mike and I, you know, we, we, uh, we used to tease back in the day when Mike got started peeling the layer of the onion. If you keep learning about what the why is, it's just fascinating <laughs> why people are, are interested. So, well, it's it, so 
this uh, anonymous has a very good, uh, are not all lawyers just a bit homicidal? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, we've been called all sorts of things. Speaking of Mike up here, who's grinning, Mike is, uh, he's your, I, I take it. He's your, your video guy, but I want to let you guys in on a little bit of inside. Let me show you, let me show you some of Mike's uh, video handiwork here. Uh oh. Man. Um, can I get a water or something? I'm so high right now, y'all. I'm about to go to sleep on y'all now. No, I, you know, how, I joke. That's not that's not Mike's work. That, uh, somebody somebody watching trial. That was the uh, YSL Young Thug Rico trial that's going on. I just I find that little thing so funny that I had to just throw it in. But no, this is this is a you might have seen it before. This is a sample of some some of Mike's video work here. Check it out. <laughs> All right, so there you go. There's Mike. Mike helped me come up with my my intro here for the channel, and uh, and so far it's been pretty well received. Um, but yeah, Senior Chief points out that was the star witness. Uh, that was what. And this this by the way, guys, this is why people watch trials because if you if you're not a trial watcher or you don't you're not lucky enough to have me to to come on here on this channel and see me with the video. You might miss those nuggets of just absolute comedy. Uh, I don't know ecstasy because it's just the it's it's sad on the one hand because it's the prosecutor's star witness and they have no idea what this witness is going to say. But at the same time, it's just you know it makes for some of the greatest um, the greatest video that will just always be be great. Um, Mike, before we, before we have to wrap it up, buddy, anything else that everybody needs to know about your project, where can they find you? Uh, yeah. what can we look for, uh, in the days and weeks and months to come? Yeah. So please go to www.trialwatchers.com and that's where you can pre-order our book. You can see a sizzle reel trailer for the docu-series and other information about the project. Uh, Neil and I will be in Charleston next week uh, for the check presentation. We're going to be meeting with uh, lawyer Eric Bland uh, on behalf of his clients to give them that check. And uh, the book will be out uh, right in time for CrimeCon back uh, end of uh, May, early June. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much. And, and with that, we're going to have to go ahead and, and call it an evening. I appreciate everyone um, who's, who's in here, who's liked and subscribed. And of course, always appreciate the super chat, the super thanks. Uh, pass, pass along to all your friends and anybody you know that might be interested in, in, um, in LawTube and have them, have them check it out. Uh, but anyway, uh, we want to say again, thanks to you guys and wish you obviously the very best of luck. And Anybody who's going to CrimeCon, uh, what's that in? Uh, is it in April, Mike? Is that right? Uh, first weekend in June. Oh, right June after okay. Memorial Day. Yep. All right, Rath, So anybody who's going to CrimeCon, go check these guys out. And um, and with that, we will we will call it a night. I really appreciate everybody who's in here, and I appreciate um, all of the support. The uh, look, I mean, the folks, you guys have have just been very humbling. It's been humbling the experience, the welcome that uh, I've been given in the, the, the streaming community, just in the brief period of time I've been doing it. Um, big shout out to uh, Eric Hunley, Viva Fry, Nate, the lawyer, uh, you know, the lead attorney, all of those people. And I'm sure I'm leaving people out, but all of those folks who have been, have been so helpful to me, it really, really means the, the world. So thanks again. And uh, we've got some more stuff. Um, Coming up very soon, we've got Lake and Riley tomorrow night. Some uh, very good interview regarding that case. You won't want to miss it. So anyway, as they say, stay tuned and uh, we'll see you next time on Inside the Law.